Okay, we, we'll make another start. So, well, good evening again, everybody. Uh, you're all very welcome to our uh, February lecture. Normally, these happen in UCC, but during COVID, we're obviously on, uh, on Zoom. First of all, I suppose I should introduce myself. I'm Declan Foley, I'm Secretary of Cork Astronomy Club, if there's anybody out there that doesn't know me. Um, normally, you'd be looking at Peter here. Unfortunately, Peter can't make it tonight, sends his apologies. So for better or worse, guys, you're, you're stuck with me for the night. Okay, so I'd just like to introduce Paul Evans. Paul is uh, delivering our lecture tonight. Paul is coming to us from just north of Larne in Northern Ireland tonight. Like lots of our generation, I suppose, Paul, you were initially inspired by the Apollo missions and especially Apollo 8, which got, you know, generated a, a lifelong interest um, in astronomy. Paul is originally from the UK, though his mother is from Athlone, so we forgive him that. Um, been living in Northern Ireland since 2003. And during then, he has become very, very well known for his photographs of Aurora, not to loosen clouds and many other sky objects. And his photographs have been displayed in lots of publications, both in the UK and in Ireland. Uh, Paul was president of the IAA on five separate occasions and is currently chair of IFAS, that's the Irish Federation of Astronomy Societies, since April 2019. Paul uh, produces a series of sky guides Sky Guide videos on YouTube. And Paul is going to talk to us tonight on some of his personal experiences with regard to Aurora and other things like that. I'm looking forward to uh, the opportunities um, that are coming up shortly. So over to you, Paul. Yeah, good. Okay. Right. So, um, really, where I'm starting from here. Um, just some experiences of things that I've done. I've traveled to places to see things and so on. Um, and it's based on the theory that our solar system is mostly sort of flat, not entirely flat, but it's flat enough that it's not uncommon for objects to pass in front of or behind other objects. And uh, here's a, a sort of somewhat, I consider an incomplete uh, picture of the solar system because I, st I still rate Pluto as a planet having uh, seen the New Horizons pictures but of course I've never actually seen Pluto. Um, anyway let's let's go back um, it's a bit over 20 years um, this really all starts for me um, with, with the 1999 eclipse. I'll just to go through some of the things I'm going to talk about eclipses of various sorts um, solar, total, partial, annular, the very strange one the hybrid eclipse Lunar eclipses, total, partial, penumbral, they're much easier to see than the solar ones because you don't generally have to go to a specific place. You just need to be on the right half of the Earth. Um, occultations, a few of those uh, planet stars, asteroids. Uh, there are only four first magnitude stars, Antares, Regulus, Aldebaran and Spica, that can be occulted by the moon. But theoretically, so can Pollux, but it hasn't happened for 800 years. There we are. And also you can see transits of things, uh, Mercury, Venus um, in, in front of the sun and um, the ISS and satellites in front of the moon. So, But let's go back to that 1999 total solar eclipse. And you'll see I've entitled this 97% because that's what I ended up seeing. But uh, I did look at um, going to see a totality here. And one of the things that I was doing, I was working on a project um, that had a deadline that could not be moved at that point because um, it was the it was the, the Y2K project. And this was, you know, this is August 1999 and um, it was all a bit busy. Um, but I did manage to take the day off um, and I just sort of thought, well, what I'll do, I'll do a last minute trip somewhere. And my first target was Dieppe in northern France, which is kind of there on the map. And I sort of tried to get a hovercraft from New Haven across to Dieppe. Um, and uh, of course, that was completely fully booked up, as you can imagine. Um, then I sort of tried to book a plane to Stuttgart in Germany. Uh, that's down here. That would be bang on the center line. That would have been great. Um, fully booked. Munich, a bit further down. And that was fully booked too. 
This was before EasyJet. Um, well, I think EasyJet did exist just about at that point, but it, it wasn't, you know, they, they didn't have a huge number of, of routes going. But I did find there was one possible plane I could get to Luxembourg. And so I talked to the travel agent and said, can you get me to Luxembourg tomorrow for the day? And they said, uh, yes, £500, because it's obviously business. It's so not over a weekend. Oh, <laughs> so, so I went to Wimbledon. That's where I lived at the time. I went up to my local common where at least the weather was sunny because down here it was all very cloudy. Now, some people did manage to see it in, in Cornwall. Um, my father was in Newquay, actually, and he managed to just, by walking along a cliff, he managed to align a clear bit of sky with the totality and he saw it but most people were clouded out including actually sir patrick moore who was on the uh, the television um at the time he was he was in falmouth down there and he was clouded out but i saw it from wimbledon and the problem with it, seeing it from wimbledon was that that was not total it was 97 percent so i learned this lesson that this needed to be planned out i couldn't just do this and say i'll go there tomorrow that doesn't work i will also tell you a story about something i did i was going to photograph this eclipse these are not my photographs this is what i saw on the television later um i did set up and i thought well you know what can i do here with what i've got and i had um, um a 75 to 300 zoom lens and my film camera um and i didn't have a filter but I did have two pairs of eclipse glasses. So I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll cut up my spare pair of eclipse glasses and I'll, it doesn't cover the front element of the lens, but what I could do, I've got a similar lens here, actually, I can show you. This isn't the exact one, um, but this is a, you know, this is actually a hundred to 300 zoom, this one. And what I did was I just sellotaped inside there, the, the IP. So I thought, well, that's a good filter. And it's not at the prime focus of the lens because that's back here somewhere. So I thought I'd be all right there. So that's what I did. And it's an, it's an experience which I will share with you just in case any of you attempted to do anything similar in the future, um, which is don't. Um, because what I did, I set that up and I put it on my camera. I thought I'll do a test shot of the sun before the eclipse starts. And it was all nice and bright and sunny. So I pointed my camera at the sun and actually through the viewfinder, I then witnessed a fire starting in the mirror box of my camera as this piece of plastic caught fire. Um, so I just took all that off and left. I said, no, oh no, I'll just put the glasses on and watch the eclipse and not try and take any photographs. So I didn't. Um, but I did want to see well, what I saw was something like this, you see, which is, which is you know, 3% of the sun. And that 3% of the sun is still full bright sunlight. So you know, it, got, it got a bit cold. It got darker in a strange sort of way in that it went monochrome because it was darker and the eye compensates for the light. But actually your colour vision gets a bit muted. Um, birds go quiet, some strange things happen. But that sliver of sun moved all the way around the moon and then started getting bigger again. I thought, no, I want that to go away completely. So I did my research and um, there was another eclipse in Zambia in 2001, which I didn't go to, but I did go to Australia um, for December the 4th, 2002, to a place called Seduna. And here's Seduna on the map. And what I can really say to you about Seduna is that it's 500 miles from Adelaide and 800 miles from Perth and not near anywhere else you've ever heard of, really. So, um, so, so what we did, we did a huge road trip, a friend of mine and I, and we, picked, we started off in Brisbane, Queensland, and we drove all the way down here to Sydney, met another friend there, drove across to Adelaide through, uh, we did sort of the Hunter Valley uh, wine regions, um, the Parks Observatory, the Dish, which is sort of in the middle there somewhere, and... Uh, arrived in Adelaide and we met up uh, with an expedition of experts from the Astronomical Association of Queensland and we all went on a coach from Adelaide to Seduna here, um, booked into a motel which was actually booked three years previously and this little town of 2,000 people had another 10,000 people descend upon it just for the eclipse and um, um, the eclipse 
the totality on this one. It's a very short eclipse. It was 32 seconds of totality. And we did a round trip of 25,000 miles to go and see it. And yes, I would go 25,000 miles again to see 32 seconds of totality. Um, so there's a, I didn't intend to take any pictures, actually, but I did take that one. Um, there was all sorts of cloud and wind during the day. It was actually quite low in the sky, eight degrees above the horizon um, at 20 to 8 local time. Uh, we had a journalist with us and he was fabulous. Um, a great guy called Spencer House. And he was uh, he did like the breakfast show on uh, um, ABC Radio in Queensland. Um, and he was well briefed about everything he needed to know, except that somebody forgot to tell him just one thing. And that's that when the totality begins, you can take your eclipse glasses off. And so someone tapped him on the shoulder uh, five seconds before the end and just said, oh, you can take those off now. And uh, he, So he saw not 32 seconds of totality, but five. Um, the beach was a mile or so long. And the people down this end of it, see this cloud here, that messed up their entire eclipse. Because from where we were there, we were just fine with it. That came over just after the end. Um, but uh, for the people down this end, that, that, that was their eclipse ruined by that cloud. Um, the, the other great story is that um, um, we all went into the restaurant and the motel afterwards. And the journalist interviewed the manager, the manageress of the hotel and said, no, did you get out to see the eclipse yourself? She, she says, well, no, I couldn't because I had people having their tea in here. And you're going like, what? There was an eclipse going on outside and you're having your, never mind. Um, but there we are. So, and that, was, that eclipse was still partial at sunset, but it was clouded out, so we missed that. Um, this was a picture I took near the end of the eclipse. Um, it's got a bit of camera shake on, which is why it's not round there. Um, and you can see here, particularly on this one, the shadow as the eclipse comes to an end. And what's weird about this picture, and it did take an eclipse expert to look at it and say, that's wrong. Um, and actually, it is right, but it's just the way that this short eclipse works. But over here and over here and over here is not in the eclipse still, but I am, um, because you can still see the moon in front of the sun there. Um, crepuscular rays here. So over here is out of the eclipse and sun is shining through the clouds and creating crepuscular rays there. Um, that's quite a, I'm quite pleased I took that photograph. I wasn't going to take any photos. I was just going to see my first eclipse and, and watch it, but I didn't. Let's watch that eclipse now. This is um, the Seduna eclipse through my video camera. Listen to the soundtrack because that's good. There you go, 32 seconds of total solar eclipse. Um, uh, some of the dialogue there um, amuses me. About five seconds before the totality, uh, you can hear um, a lady saying that she can't get the lid off her binoculars, and I, I want to know if she ever did. I never found out, but uh, there we are. That's, that's Seduna, 4th of December 2002, my first total solar eclipse, 32 seconds long and absolutely fabulous.
Now, sometimes it doesn't work for you. This, um, this was the next eclipse I attempted to go to on 31st of May 2003 in Scotland, where you could theoretically see an annular solar eclipse. It's one of those weird ones that sort of um, comes over the pole, and we could theoretically see it in Scotland. As you see, we didn't. Um, and I kick myself for this because if I'd really thought about it, um, I'd have simply piled everything in the car and just run up the nearest mountain. Um, and uh, we'd probably have seen at least a partial phase there. To see the annually, you had to be right on the coast, but it was deeply partial, a bit inland, and I should have just gone up the nearest mountain and, and seen that. Um, but we kind of waited patiently for the fog to clear, and it never did. Um, that's uh, Scotland. So here's the next thing I saw, a transit of Venus. I happened to be in Yorkshire at the time. Now, Venus transits happen in two pairs, eight years apart. Then you have to wait another 121 for the next one. Um, so um, I, I saw uh, this one on the 8th of June 2004. I did not see its subsequent partner on the 6th of June 2012. I was here then. It was, it was just as foggy as it was in Scotland. Uh, that day we didn't see anything at all. And I won't be seeing any more of them because the next one is in December 2117. So uh, medical miracles aside, I'll not be seeing that. Uh, but it was it was interesting to see. Um, it, it sort of we saw Venus come onto the solar disk here, and over a few hours it moved this way. The weather got worse and worse and worse. Um, but so here, for example, this is one of the first pictures I managed to see. Um, that's that's one of the last. I was further up in Yorkshire. We were sort of driving towards um, the Cairn Ryan ferry at that point during the day. Um, this is my cheap little 40 pound little telescope that was great for just slinging in the back of the car. Um, I don't have it anymore, but I have an even smaller one for that purpose now. That was the Venus Trans. Very glad to have seen one. Okay, so um, I, in the meantime, I'd actually got married at this point to, to Jude, and um, she wanted to see a total solar eclipse too, because she hadn't seen one by this point. So we ent ended up going off to Turkey, um, and we got uh, perfect. Uh, almost perfect weather. We stayed in Antalya here and we went to a viewing site um, just inland from Side there, a place called Manavgat. Um, it's just right on the center line um, near the Turkish coast. Weather was great, just slightly light thin cloud caused by the eclipse. It actually, it's, um, um, as, as the air cools down, you get some condensation. That's, that's what happened to us there but it was an excellent view nonetheless um here's some pictures i got actually and uh, uh those are the partial phases there this is one of the effects you get of the sun the partially eclipsed sun shining through a bush and it actually um, casts images of the crescent like that and this is my best image of the totality um i did have a setup where i had a um a 75 300 lens and a teleconverter and a, and a homemade barter filter. Um, and unfortunately, uh, when I removed the filter, I just nudged the focus off a bit. So you'll see that that's not quite as sharp as I really wanted it to be, but it was, it was a great view and a great experience. So uh, um, 29th of March, 2006. So um, a different kind of eclipse altogether. This is a, um, a total lunar eclipse. And as I say before, the great thing about those is you only have to be on the right half of the earth. Um, which um, included Larn at that point where we lived, just down the road from where we are now, and great timing as well. Actually, it was it was in the evening. Um, the 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 peak of the eclipse was twenty past eleven at night, um, but it started um, first of all with the penumbral phase phase rather, um, twenty eighteen. Then the first umbral phase, i.e., when this bit contacts the the, the bottom of the moon down there, um, that was half past nine. Then it, the totality begins at U2, 22, 44, then it gets darker and darker in the middle here. This is all refracted through Earth's atmosphere. So um, you'll get, where it's coming through a lot of atmosphere, it, you get this red cast to it. Where it's going through the sort of thin ozone at the top, it's more bluish. And then, of course, you get the full sunlight there, which is much, much brighter. Um, and the point is that lasts, that total phase, lasts for an hour and 13 minutes, which is amazing. Um, it is an approximate rule of thumb that the moon moves through the sky its own diameter in an hour. And that's really rough, roughly what's going on here. Um, so 
I got some great pictures from that. I lost a lot of them actually because uh, um, I actually had a hard drive failure days after, but uh, I managed to rescue a lot of it. Um, that was one of the pictures of the totality I got. Um, that's actually a webcam mosaic. I was, I was able to do 11 sequences of video there, which you don't normally get during an eclipse, but uh, with the lunar one, it takes, you know, it gives you so much time um, that you can do that. And uh, that's a, quite a, um, a nice picture there. Aristarchus is still the brightest crater on the moon, even during a total eclipse. They are. Uh, so this was a very wide field view of that. And this is the moon down here, totally eclipsed. This is Saturn. Um, this is Leo. So we've got the, the, the hind legs of Leo there and then the backwards question mark or sickle at the front of Leo just there. But uh, that was that was quite a night um, the, the sky truly delivered perfectly for that. OK. There's another one, occultation of Saturn, um, 22nd of May 2007. And this is where um, you can look at it this way, that the moon passes in front of Saturn. And um, I, I sort of, I use this a lot in my sort of outreach work. Um, and I explain it as the Father Ted thing. Um, the moon actually is small, but Saturn is far away. And the numbers of this work like this, that um, Saturn without the rings, i.e. the main body of Saturn, is about 32 times the diameter of the moon but it's 4,000 times further away. So the moon looks big and Saturn looks tiny. Um, whereas in practice, of course, it's the other way around. Um, but this I just shot with a telescope in my back garden, webcam, laptop. I did, I've managed to get enough frames just to stack up Saturn a little bit there, um, but it was actually moving really quite fast. Um, so that's um, the Saturn occultation. Um, the next year, December 4th, 2008, Venus occultation. Now, this, this was actually a daytime exposure, about two thousandth of a second. Um, and the crescent moon is here. And that was about the last picture I got of Venus before it was actually um, eclipsed or occulted by the moon, because you imagine the moon comes around here like this. Um, but that was actually about three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, then it was actually, um, it was quite a long time later, I think it was more than an hour later, that Venus came out of the other side. Now, my weather was deteriorating terribly by this point, but I did manage to get my camcorder onto it. And I've just got uh, a little bit of video here of, uh, of, of Venus coming out from behind the moon. We're beginning to lose it. And there's Venus. I've got Venus. Here she comes. So that was really quite amazing to watch. And my takeaway from it is just how much brighter Venus is than the moon. Um, you probably don't necessarily get it quite so much when you see them, um, you know, quite even quite close to each other in the sky. But when, the, when Venus is coming out from behind the moon like that, it is so obviously so much brighter. Um, simply because one higher albedo, I mean, the moon's reflectivity is about 12% and Venus is about 75 um, and of course, Venus is that much nearer the sun as well. So Venus is much, much brighter surface wise than the moon, although because it's bigger, the moon's magnitude is quoted as, a, as, as being brighter, um, but it's not. Okay, so uh, if you're going to go and see a total eclipse, it's worth making a good holiday out of it. And we did this when we went to see the longest totality of the 21st century in China in 2009. And uh, we went to we went all over the place. We went on an escorted tour because that's the only way you're allowed to do it in China. We went to the Bird's Nest Stadium here, uh, Beijing Observatory, the Great Wall, Terracotta Warriors. And that's that was our hotel actually in Haining. And that's um, Shanghai. Um, and this was Eclipse Day. And Eclipse Day, as you can see, was a bit of a disappointment um, because it was really quite cloudy. Not so cloudy that we missed the whole thing because we didn't, but... Uh, uh, we got lots of unfiltered photos of, of the sun in various parts of the clips. And uh, these two pictures are opposites and they're taken four minutes apart, bottom left and bottom right corners, because that's as close as I got 
to the totality. The cloud was enough just to completely obscure the corona, but I did get those very thin crescents at, uh, just before and after the totality. Also, um, about seven or eight minutes after totality, I just happened to have my telephoto lens pointed at the sun, no filter, just that provided by Mother Nature. I thought, oh, here comes a plane. Thought, oh, I've got the shutter release in my hand. So I just pressed the button and this I got this uh, Chinese Airbus um, flying past the moon, um, partially eclipsed there. So that was China. OK, here's another one, a near miss. Now, here's an interesting one, actually. I don't know if any of you guys in Cork saw this event. Um, it, it was about four o'clock in the morning um, on the 15th of July 2012, and uh, it was a lot long before dawn as, as the sun was rising. And um, um, there was a close or near miss of the moon and Jupiter. And you can see, actually, it was clouded before, but this very closest pass, which would have been here. But as the moon was a bit further on, um, I did get this view of, of the four Galilean moons and, um, and, and the crescent moon with Earthshine. And had you guys seen this, you would actually have seen an occultation of Jupiter, whereas I wouldn't. Because the line um, where that was uh, an occultation um, sort of went through somewhere about Dublin. So, you know, you, 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 could have, you could have seen an occultation, but I never quite would have done. And it's amazing how, you know, although the moon is a quarter of a million miles away, the parallax uh, is just sufficient that, you know, that the length of Ireland um, is enough to make a difference as to whether that is obscured or not. OK, um, another of those deep partial eclipses that I've seen, um, 20th of March 2015. Now, here was the, here was the setup here that the, the eclipse was total along. Um, that's the, the black line is the center line. The dark bit is actually where you would get some sort of totality. And the Faroe Islands was in the totality. Also further up here, um, um, Spitsbergen, um, which is part of Norway. The Faroe Islands was where many people went. And the trouble was the Faroe Islands, it was completely clouded out. Whereas Larne here, actually, and I had a small gathering down at the, down at the harbour, cut the telescopes, a bit of projection. That's when my, my Skylux was projecting there. And a um, couple of other guys bought scopes as well. I got everybody sunglasses through IFAS. Um, and uh, so this looks a bit like one of those 3D movies, doesn't it? The, the, all wearing the, the, the dark glasses, but uh, um, and it worked for us. Um, in fact, actually, that's a photo I got. Um, that, believe it or not, is a photograph of a cardboard box with a sheet of A3 paper um, on it, which I on to which I projected the sun um, and its 93% eclipse um, with through my Skylux telescope with a 10 millimeter eyepiece on it. And I kept it all nice and low so that there was no eye hazard there. Um, but And you can actually see here mountains and valleys on the edge of the moon. I was really impressed with how that's come out. And uh, it took a bit of processing, obviously, to make the, the white paper black and so on. But um, it's, a, it's a great picture. And uh, it's great to have an eclipse visible in Larn, even if it's only 93%. But it did, we did go through all that feeling of coldness and the birds... Um, making a lot of noise and then no noise. It's very strange. Uh, but uh, that extra 7% of sun wouldn't go away. So that's that's being in the wrong place. We got two eclipses in Larne actually in 2015. And the second one was actually a lunar eclipse um, late on the night of my birthday, which was a nice little present. Um, and we we're in the right sort of place because we're here and all eclipses visible there. Um, so that was a, that was a good one, and that was a photo I got there of that. It was the sky was a bit more hazy um, on that occasion than it was on the uh, 2007 eclipse that I showed you earlier. Um, but it's pretty good, and I've got uh, a whole time lapse of things which I arranged in a sort of clock formation like that, which uh, I've exhibited that photo in a couple of the exhibitions around the place, and it seems to go down quite well. Um, you can see down here, particularly, it was getting particularly hazy towards the end. Uh, but that was the total lunar eclipse of 2015. Um, then we all got together at Queen's University, the IAA, and um, 
and the astrophysics department there. We all, all got together outside the front of Queens for um, the May the 9th, 2016 Mercury occultation. And that was by and large pretty good. There was some cloud during the afternoon, so we didn't get the full um, sort of six hours of the event, but we've got some great pictures. There's two, two here that I took, uh, one, one through a very top quality Takahashi refractor, um, which I managed to put my camera on. And you can see Mercury here. Mercury is much, much tinier and further away than Venus. So it, it, compared to a Venus transit, a Mercury transit is not quite so spectacular. Um, but that's it there. And what I get from this is if you look at this picture, I don't know if it comes across on Zoom, but the black of Mercury is much blacker than the not really very black of the sunspots. You realise that the sunspots aren't completely dark, but Mercury against the sun is. Um, this is an H alpha scope, um, and you can see that there's various prominences around the edge of the sun. There are a few filaments on it as well, and this is Mercury down here. Um, a bit of a bit of red light sort of bleeds into that, so it doesn't show up quite as contrasty as it does through the the very expensive refractor that I used for that one. So that was the Mercury occultation. Now, this is a bit of an odd one. Um, I said at the beginning that the solar system isn't quite flat. In fact, it's quite a bit not flat in at places and times. And this here um, is a stellarium grab of the sun just uh, at sunrise and Venus. And I've measured the distance between about it's over eight degrees. And so before sunrise on this morning, the 25th of uh, March, 2017, I got up nice and early to see, and before the sun rose, I mean, there's plenty of, obviously, um, you know, of, of, of dusk uh, coming on here, dawn rather. Um, but I managed to photograph um, Venus there just like five hours before inferior conjunction. Um, and something that would be theoretically impossible if the solar system was actually flat, but the fact that it's sort of bent by a few degrees, that's about as far away from the sun as inferior conjunction ever happens is that eight degrees there um, but uh, so definitely no transit on that occasion uh, but uh, that was that was venus then i started getting interested in other things actually and i i, I actually had a 4k camera at that point um, and i was able to do this with it this is the international space station passing in front of the moon um, as taken from carnlock which is just a bit further up the county antrim coast from where i am now there's a website, um, transit-finder.com, and you can put your coordinates and, and desired dates and uh, an indication of how far you're prepared to travel into that, and it will tell you when the International Space Station is going in front of the moon or the sun. Um, there are two different sorts of lunar ones. This is, this is one. This one, the ISS, is illuminated by the sun, so it is not yet in Earth's shadow. Uh, and I've managed to capture that. You, you'll see the ISS being made of metal. It's the same distance from the sun as the moon, so it comes out a bit brighter. Um, but that's, uh, and I, I used a bit more data from the same capture um, to get a bit more moon data in, so I could actually show moon colors a bit as well. Um, the rusty color is iron and the blue color is titanium. Um, and Clavius, my favorite crater, is very visible in that one. Um, the reason Clavius is my favorite crater is that when I do outreach talks to people, I sort of say, Clavius, for scale, it's the same size as Northern Ireland here. So where I am on the coast up here and down to Enniskill, and uh, it's about the same distance as the diameter of uh, Clavius. Or to put it another way, if you took your car to the moon, you could drive it across Clavius in about two hours at 60 miles an hour. That's how it works. So that's uh, done a few of those uh, moon transits. Um, the other one is actually, if you... If you do this with um, the ISS in Earth's shadow, you get a, silhouette, a line of silhouettes across there. These are individual frames of 4K video, 1 30th of a second apart, by the way. Um, now, I did see this, but it was nothing to write home about the total lunar eclipse of 24th of January 2019. But it was so misty that all I could see is, is, a, is a fuzzy red blob where the moon was. It was a pity because about two or three hours earlier, it was great, except the moon wasn't eclipsed then. But I watched one of the, um, this was from a telescope in, I think, California. 
um, this one, and there was actually an impact visible during the eclipse, and this was it. And it's not just a hot pixel, because other telescopes picked it up as well. So that was an interesting one there, but uh, not so much for me, because what I saw was nothing like that, of course, but uh, to see actually an impact on the moon happen during an eclipse, when it's sort of, the, you know, the surface is darker and it's easier to see, uh, was quite something. Mercury transit again, November the 11th, 2019. Um, that's the last one of those. There's Mercury in the middle, looking quite good. Um, that was actually just after a storm. I managed to get that. There was a, there was a real rainstorm and, uh, um, and, and uh, I sort of gave up on it. And then just actually as the sun was coming close to setting, I managed to, to get some pictures of it. So that was good. And there's a comparison between the two transits, the Venus transit 2004, the Mercury transit 2019. And you can see the huge difference in the size of the two planets. Um, not only is, is, is Venus nearly three times the diameter of Mercury, but Mercury is further away necessarily too. So uh, that's, that's those. Um, here's one more. Um, solar pass of the International Space Station. This is the International Space Station going in front of the sun, you're looking at about 1.7 seconds there. It's 30, it's, I think it's 54 space stations there. And this is a 30 frames per second 4K camera, um, Panasonic on the back of a small refractor. Um, you just, you know, it, it, but the technology that come together to make this possible includes the fact that your phone has a clock in it that's like atomically, you know, sequenced off the... Uh, of, of the internet so you know exactly what time this is going to happen and you can just start filming a few seconds before that and you'll get it um, so that's that's um, a solar pass um, of the international space station and really that's all the events i'm going to talk about apart from just i'm going to quickly whiz through some bits that are going to happen in the future upcoming total solar eclipses well for us 2090, 23rd of September 2090, the south of Ireland just gets it. Um, and when I say the south, um, I mean, you know, even south of where you are in Cork. I um, don't know where you all actually are, but um, it's, this is sort of a, um, a mizzen head job. I'll show you a map in a moment. Uh, this one comes into northern Spain in August 2026. There's a totality through Gibraltar and North Africa in August 2027. Now, if you fancy going to Sydney for a thing, great city, um, an eclipse goes right through the middle of Sydney on July 22nd, 2028. Um, and then there's another one in Southern Africa and Australia, which is almost a repeat of the one that I saw in 2002. It's not the same Sauros even, it's different, um, but it follows more or less the same path. And it comes ashore in Australia at a place called Streaky Bay, which is just 20 miles along the coast from Seduna, where I saw the eclipse I showed you from 2002, and that's uh, 25th of November 2030. So that's, uh, um, I don't know, I might, I might do that. But the easiest one to get to, well, no, sorry, I'll do this one first. This is, this is the Cork one. Now, this is, you see what I mean, that uh, Cork is just off the path of totality. Yeah, this pink band is the path of totality. Um, this is in the evening of... Uh, 23rd of September 2090. Uh, the peak is half past six in the evening and Cork is just there. So you'd have to go a little bit down towards say, uh, Mizzen Head or that sort of direction um, to see that. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. But this is the easiest one to see that's coming up. Um, 8th of April 2024. Um, it goes, actually goes right across the United States. It comes up from the Pacific in, through Mexico. Um, Texas and actually goes right the way up. It is total at Niagara Falls um, and it is total close to Montreal in Canada. But now the, the, the received wisdom of this one is that the further to the bottom left you are here, including going into Mexico, the better the weather prospects are. Um, I quite fancy going to Texas because my auntie lives kind of just there on Galveston Island. Um, and uh, you can fly into Houston, Dallas quite easily, hire a car. But I suspect, like the previous American eclipse, it'll all be very crowded on the day as, uh, you know, loads of people come in from this way and this way uh, to see it. But that's, um, you know, assuming that uh, 
that travel is a thing again by then. I hope very much it is. It's only just over two years now. Um, but uh, the 2024 total solar eclipse in America would be great. So that's really all I have to say to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. That was absolutely amazing. <clears throat> yeah, lots of things to look forward to there and memories of some of the ones that, that you spoke of. Um, I was lucky enough as part of the, the club, there was oh, 20 plus of us maybe, went to Portland uh, in 20, August 2017 for the total solar eclipse. And it is simply an amazing experience. I would absolutely encourage anyone if they get an opportunity to see a solar eclipse, go for it. It is a once in a lifetime. And um, yeah, amazing. Okay, so I'll hand over now to Tony and to John, who will um, go through the questions uh, with, with, with Paul. Uh, Paul, that, that was very interesting. Um, um, I found it a, a, a very uh, informative. I've um, a number of people here, a lot of them, most of the, the they're not really questions, just people thanking you for, for the, the talk. A question here. Have you ever met anyone who found watching a solar eclipse to be unpleasant an, an unpleasant experience? While for most, I'm sure it's a joyous experience. I wonder, are there some people who find it unsettling? I, I, I never have. Now, of course, in times gone by, um, you know, eclipses, when they were known about by some people and not by others, that were, were, you know, the stories of ancient tribes who were threatened with the wrath of God sort of thing. Uh, and then it came true, uh, being plunged into darkness, and they were terrified of that. But in, in terms, in modern terms, I have, I have met someone who was not unpleasantly so, but, but was very deeply affected by it. And I'll give you a, a rough uh, tonight. This is the, the, the Seduna eclipse. I went to the 2002 Seduna eclipse. And, um, and on that expedition were a, um, a mature couple. Um, I won't name them because they, probably, they may get to watch this, but uh, um, and they were eclipse chasers and they'd been all over the world chasing total eclipses and whatever. And they led this expedition and and their daughter came with them and their daughter was about 25. Um, and it's because because they were Australian, you know, it was it was a local trip by Australian standards um, for them. And, and their daughter, who was a very clever girl, she was a lawyer. Um, and um, she came with her parents really just to see what this was all about because she had previously been of the opinion that her parents were barking mad um, you know traveling thousands of miles to go and see this in this case 32 seconds of just something happening um, and so she came and she and she went and she watched it and for the next half an hour she just fell apart she was in tears the whole time um, because she realised that actually her parents weren't barking mad you know, and that this really was quite an awesome thing to see. So it did affect her like that, but that was not in a bad way, but but in, the, in a quite, you know, surprising way, I suppose, to me, because I just, I suppose I knew what was going on and what would happen. And so it was like that only much better, really, for me. But um, I haven't seen anybody distressed or unsettled by the whole thing but that's the place to have seen i suppose they know what they're, they're heading for when they're when they intend to to go to to observe it in the first place so they're, they're yeah. not likely i suppose yeah um just a question for myself uh you went as far as australia for you said 32 seconds of totality yep you didn't consider going to the us uh, a few years ago in 2017 um, for, for two, two to two and a half minutes. Do you know? Um, I looked at it. We, we seriously looked at it, um, and everything—the the price of everything—anywhere near that line of totality, just became absurd. I mean, I, I was offered. Uh, when I looked. I was offered three nights in a hut in Wyoming. I had to get there and back myself. But three nights in a hut in Wyoming, 
in the national park on the line of totality was four thousand two hundred dollars you know and, <laughs> uh, um, and and actually we sort of we compared bucket lists and and my wife wanted to go to the Grand Canyon. And so in March 2018, we did that instead, you know. <laughs> and actually the picture that's my background was taken on that trip as well. That's Meteor Crater, which which I hadn't seen before and I always wanted to see. So uh, um, so so really what that was, it was so expensive that we did something else instead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a question, uh, any tips for taking pics of the December Mars occultation coming up? First of all, the, the thing is going to be the weather. Um, I'm not sure, with it, I'm not, I haven't even, it's far enough away that one, I haven't even looked into the, the timing details or anything of it yet, but do we see it here? Or do we have to go somewhere for that one? I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure about it, but, but I mean, the thing about it is you know exactly where it's going to happen, because the moon is there. Um, and you'll see, I don't know whether you see Mars going in or Mars coming out or both. Okay. Um, again, that's a matter of timing. Um, the, the, the most crucial thing is the weather, and you can either leave that down to luck or try and influence your luck by going somewhere where it's likely to be better, um, you know, consulting the previous day's weather forecasts and being prepared to move maybe and all that. Um, but really... Um, a tracked telescope and a webcam or a, or a camera on a tripod with a telephoto lens will, will get you all you need to get for that. Um, so it's, it's not a difficult one to, to photograph or see. Uh, binoculars will give you a great view of it. Um, but it's a question of being somewhere that you can actually see it, um, both from the, the, you know, the timing point of view and um, the weather mm -hmm. would be my... They're the crucial factors. Yeah. There is actually a very interesting question just turned up in the chat. I'm just seeing uh -huh. here from Philip. Um, and and the answer, because the answer is yes, totally. Um, when I saw, when, when I saw my first totality, it, it affected my entire outlook on the universe. So it doesn't come much more profound than that. You know? mm -hmm. uh, um, it really did, you know, the feeling that I could you know, read in a book that if I go to this beach 12,000 miles from home on this day and this time, that this would happen, um, did did affect me really quite deeply and, and sort of thought, well, you know, this is amazing how the universe works like this and that we've worked it all out. We haven't worked all of it out yet, but we've worked out a lot of things um, that I could do this. I think this is fantastic. And it's, you know, and to the second, Yes, it happened. I think that's, you know, uh, and so that, that really has pushed forward what has been a 50 plus year interest in space and astronomy anyway. Um, that pushed it forward quite a bit for me, you know, so, so yes, it did. Uh, I felt very touched um, and, and very affected by it. Yeah, I could concur with that because before going to America for the 2017 one, you know, obviously read up and watched a lot of videos on it and a lot of people were commenting on how emotional it was and i'm saying it's a lot of rubbish like what's yeah. emotional it's three bodies in space lining up you have to be in the right place at the right time you know to get over it um but when i experienced it i found what to my amazement it was actually very very emotional i yeah. don't know why i can't explain it but it actually was deeply moving yeah yeah okay Paul, I know you have to be up at the crack of dawn in the morning. I do. Um, no, but, no, but three hours before the crack of dawn, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, look, we, we won't delay you. Thank That's you. Okay. Thank you again. Um, uh, we, we really enjoyed it. And as you say, we look forward to better times when you can come down and talk to us in person. Yeah. And we would, we would absolutely love, love to have you.